we're looking at United Nations treaties. And these are sometimes called treaties, but other words that are used are conventions or covenants. You will find all three words being used for United Nations treaties, sometimes called conventions, sometimes called covenants. So we begin with what is a treaty or a covenant or a, or a convention? It's an international legal instrument. And a treaty imposes binding legal obligations upon a state that is a party to that treaty. So states have to actually sign up to these treaties. And as Terry explained, the Universal Periodic Review is universal. It, it deals with all states, but not every state has signed every treaty of the United Nations. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. A state can become party to a treaty by ratifying it. Ratify is an important word. And that means that the state voluntarily decides to be bound by its provisions. And then we get the term state party. So if your country has ratified a particular treaty, it has become a state party to that treaty. So you'll, you'll frequently see that term state party or state parties. The state then becomes obligated under international law to uphold and implement the provisions of the treaty. So the treaty is there, the state ratifies it, and then it's obliged under international law to implement the provisions of that treaty. This means that domestic legislation of the state party must be in conformity with the provisions of the treaty and cannot contradict them in any way. So when a country ratifies a treaty, it often has to make changes to its domestic law to make sure that law is in line with the provisions of the treaty that it has ratified. So that's just a slide explaining what a treaty is and the obligations it creates for a party or for a state that ratifies a particular treaty. Now, how many treaties or covenants are there? Again, as, as Tino mentioned at the start, don't worry about all this. You'll get a recording. I'm going to get through it. There's quite a lot of treaties, but just observe which treaties are presently in existence. So we begin in 1948. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was systematized for the first time in 1948, and it derives from the UN Charter. So that was the beginning, if you like, of UN treaties, the Universal Declaration. It's notice it's called a Declaration of Human Rights. Now, sometime later, the uh, Universal Declaration enumerated a number of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. So it covered the whole range of rights under those five headings. And there were two treaties developed to uh, explain this further. The first one is called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And that came into being in 1966. So quite a gap between 1948, the Universal Declaration, and then the Annunciation of this International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1966. In the same year, a second covenant was enumerated a covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. So these two covenants were trying to elaborate upon the Universal Declaration, give clearer direction. And then when all three of these are put together, the Universal Declaration and these two covenants, those three items are sometimes called the International Bill of Rights. So the International Bill of Rights consists of the Uni Universal Declaration, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So over the years, human rights have been developing. And we now move on to subsequent developments after 1966. Well, this one actually was before 1966 because this was the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. That came into being in 1965. And it was followed by 
the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in 1979. So these two conventions deal with discrimination, racial discrimination in the first one, and all forms of discrimination against women in the second one. And then in 1984, we had the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. 1984, and is sometimes called the CAT. And then an important convention for Edmund Rice International came into existence in 1989, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And a lot of ERI's work focuses on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the CRC. And continuing on then, in 1990, we had the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Their Families. And that was followed in 2006 by the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And then again in 2006, the Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance. Now, you might be wondering how many of these treaties has your country actually ratified? And there's a very useful website, which I've indicated there on the last point, where you can find out country by country, which countries have ratified which treaties. And as I mentioned before, not every treaty has been ratified by every country. And you'll often find that when countries are being reviewed in the Universal Periodic Review, that they're reminded about the treaties that they have not ratified and they're asked to ratify them. It comes up quite frequently at the Universal Periodic Review. But you can check on that website how your country is doing, how many of the treaties has it actually ratified. Now to summarize in one slide, all these treaties, we look at the following. I have the treaty on the left, and then the treaty body on the right. And remember, treaty bodies are committees. So for civil and political rights, you've got the HRC, the Human Rights Committee. It deals with civil and political rights. The next one deals with economic, social, and cultural rights. And then we have the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, CERD, C-E-R-D. You've got the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. You have the Committee Against Torture, CAT. The Committee on the Rights of the Child, CRC. The Committee on the Protection of Migrant Workers, CMW. And the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD. And the final one, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances. So I'll give you a moment just to look at that complete slide. And that's a summary of the nine core treaties, international treaties on the left and the related treaty body on the right. So just take a moment to review that particular slide. You could be asking yourself the question, you're not going to be dealing with all of these treaty bodies, but are there one or two of those treaty bodies that would be of particular relevance to your work or to your interest in advocacy and human rights? For example, you might be interested in the Committee on the Rights of the Child because you're involved, say, in education, or you might be interested in the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities if you're dealing with people with disabilities. But don't, don't imagine that you have to engage with every one of these treaty bodies. You look at the one that's relevant to your situation and to the civil right that you want to pursue. So moving on then, what do treaty bodies do? 
This is now the work of the treaty body. You now know about the treaties. There, there are those nine treaties there. There are nine committees. What do these committees actually do? Well, all treaty bodies are committees. Remember that in the Universal Periodic Review, it's country reviewing country. This is not like that at all. This is a body, this is a committee. And what does the committee do? It receives and considers reports submitted by the state party. So if your country has become a state party to a particular treaty, it has to report to this committee on a particular time scale. And not only has it to report, but it may have to come before a meeting of the committee. So the, the treaty bodies hold meetings with state parties and they do it in person or during the pandemic, some of these meetings were held online. So the treaty body receives reports submitted by the state party and it holds meetings with the state party. And at the end of these meetings and at, when it has considered the reports, the committee issues concluding observations or recommendations to assist the states in implementing their obligations. Now, one thing I'd say about treaty bodies is this, that they're quite different from the UPR. This is a committee. Independent experts make up the committee and they can ask very penetrating questions of the state under review by the committee. So they can be much more hard hitting and can get into greater detail with the state in relation to that particular treaty that the state has ratified. Now, another thing that treaty bodies do, they develop general comments or recommendations interpreting the provisions of their respective treaties. So the treaty is there, it may have a certain number of articles, and from time to time, the committee may make a comment about some of these articles to provide clarifications or to explain things more clearly. So that's one thing too that treaty bodies do. And then some treaty bodies may perform additional functions such as they may consider individual communications. You can communicate with the treaty body and ask them to consider a particular issue that you have. And also they can conduct or initiate inquiries. And finally, they can conduct investigations through country visits. So for example, a member of a treaty body, a member of the committee, could pay a visit to a country that has ratified that particular treaty, just to see how are things getting on on the ground in that particular country. So here are three questions for you to consider. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to answer them now, but just I think these are questions that would be useful in, in future engagement with these mechanisms. Which of the UN treaties are most relevant to your involvement in advocacy and human rights? As I said, you can't deal with them all. There may be one or two that you feel that would be relevant to what I'm involved in. And then very important to check out which of these treaties has been ratified by your country. If your country hasn't ratified the treaty, well, then you can't get involved with that treaty on behalf of that country. It's only when the country has ratified it that it's then obliged to implement its, its articles. And then a third point or a third question is, what point is your country at in relation to reporting on any of the UN treaties it has ratified? You'll sometimes find that countries are rather slow in making reports to the treaty body, to the committee. The committee has to remind them that the report is due. So you would to be important to find out, and there's a website where you can do that, where you can find out when is your country due to make a report to the treaty body. So I'm going to stop there.